Hypnosis. I'm your host, Deacon John, joined by my co-host, Jason Memo. Hello, Jason. Hello there. And we've got Dr. Ed Lincoln, scholar, professor, and author of the Theater of the Occult Revival, who's going to be talking to us about the Theater of the Occult Revival, as well as theater, gnosis, gnosticism, occultism, all that good stuff. Hello, Dr. Lincoln. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So before we can uh, raise up the curtain and have the first act start, uh, we have uh, a little bit of an introduction, which sucks, which is, but the, hey, if this is the first time I've ever listened to the show, don't turn it off. <laughs> but this is where we beg you for money. Uh, we can't do the show without your financial support. So uh, you can help us out by doing uh, signing up and subscribing on patreon.com slash Gnostic for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. In return, you get the shows early. And if there's anything else we could do for you, let us know. Uh, we usually only charge for, you know, four to five pieces of media a month. We try to make more. And we want to give our patri patro patrons, pa patrons our patrons more uh but we don't want to lock up any content behind a paywall so you know if you want something from us just let us know but we actually can't do the show uh, uh without uh that that those dirty dirty shackles uh paypal.com slash gnostic for one-time donations and we know that these are difficult times and you may not be able to help us out with money you can also like and subscribe you can tell people about the show you can share it on your social media that really helps us out a lot okay so dr lincoln uh this is a show that i, I always open the show if we're really excited and pumped but that's because we had the best guests in the world and we're very passionate <laughs> about the topic but i i'm a recovering play uh playwright and director jason is mm -hmm. presently a theater professional so this is a topic that's that's very close to our hearts to our mm -hmm. careers and into mm -hmm. some of our wider passions uh, mm -hmm. dr lincoln can you tell us what is the occult revival even though we've talked about it before on the show the so-called occult revival and, and what does it have to do with theater okay well uh from my standpoint the occult revival is a uh sudden upsurge in interest in uh uh creating worldviews that are built on esoteric practices, particularly uh, practices that offer means of contacting the supernatural or practices that uh, offer means of uh, manipulating an, an otherwise invisible reality and pulling invisible or occult hidden sources from that uh, realm and using it to uh, achieve certain purposes. And uh, usually when people talk about the occult revival, the names that come up like in the United States in the, uh, in the 1840s to 1850s, it's the Fox sisters and spiritualism. And then in Europe, always Alephus Levy pops up as uh, in 1856, his, his book on, uh, on, on the secrets of uh, high magic uh, or what, uh, weight translated as uh, transcendental magic uh, in English. Uh, and then we think about the rise of societies dedicated to the practice of magic, like uh, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is obviously one of the big players in that scene. And then we, uh, as well, we have the rise of theosophy and the breakoff groups like anthroposophy and groups like that. Uh, so what you had was this really fascinating time where all these groups popped up and and uh and and so as far as the occult revival is concerned you you have this upsurge of, of these groups and these organizations and individuals who uh, start getting interested in these things and as far as its connections to theater uh i would say that that connection really starts to become apparent with the emergence of uh symbolism uh, first in France and then in Russia and 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 then in uh, and in between, uh, because the symbolists were really interested in, uh, as be they poets or musicians or theater artists, they were really interested in somehow uh, uh, invoking uh, uh, the invisible, the otherwise invisible through their art. Uh, so for me. That, that's where it really starts to happen is around uh, 1880, 1890s, we start to see theater artists suddenly really interested in the occult revival. And the, most of them, almost all of them are already deeply involved in it on some level. Yeah. And the 
Did you see a link between theater and occult ritual that, that's not really there of other forms of art? Like, of course, we have talked about on the show before, you mentioned that, that it's not just theater. You know, these occultists are intersecting with the symbolist movements. So you have painting, you have mm -hmm. music, you have other mm -hmm. artistic disciplines. But, mm -hmm. but do you feel like there's something really special, a, a strong connection between the theatrical performance and ritual performance? And is, was there connections between theater and the occult before the, the so-called occult revival? Oh, well, let's start with that. <laughs> the <laughs> connections between uh, theater and the occult revival go back to the origins of, uh, I mean, the correct connections between theater and um, the invisible realm, what in modern terms we might call the occult realm, uh, the spiritual realm, those go all the way back to the beginning of theater. Uh, you know, most people will start talking about it uh, in Greece, you know, they'll, they'll look at Greece. And the truth is, is that the initial Greece performances were uh, those, those famous tragedies that we know of, and even the comedies that we know of were part of a uh, uh, event that started in the sixth century in Greece, and it, and it blew up and got bigger and bigger, uh, called the city Dionysia. Dionysus is the god of the, uh, the god of theater. And uh, so those, those initial plays were part of the mysteries of Dionysus. Um, and yet there were also other dramatic mysteries that were done in secret, the mystery cults of the time period. And we have uh, ancient writers like Pausanias who, who wrote a lot about the mysteries of Eleusis. Um, and I also went to, I took a group of students to South Italy and we went to uh, Pompeii and they talked about how in addition to the Roman theater in Pompeii, the external Roman theater, there was once a, uh, a secret theater that had rights. And many mm -hmm. people have argued that, uh, including Edward Charest, uh, some of the great thinkers of the occult revival had, did research and, and they believe, some people believe that there was a connection between the rituals that were done for the public at the tragedies and then the uh, you know the theaters done the theater done there, and then possibly mystery dramatics that were done in secret uh, for initiated members of a specific cult. Uh, but even before that, because many people say they they look at Greece, but the truth is uh, there's there there's a document like the Stele of Ikernefret, uh, which is an Egyptian document dating back to the Middle Kingdom, so somewhere between 1700 BCE and 2000 BCE. There's a document that clearly states there were dramatic uh, uh, rituals being performed where they're performing the life and death of Osiris at that point. Um, so that connection between the occult and drama is organic, and it goes back a really long time. And what was interesting about the people in the theater of the occult revival is they were, in my opinion, trying to uh, put really religiosity and theater back together because it had been officially separated by kings and queens in England somewhere around, I think it was Queen Elizabeth uh, said no more religious theater was allowed around 1559 in England. And that kind of followed suit all over Europe because of the uh, problems that happened with the Protestant Reformation and people were putting on uh, kind of inflammatory or they weren't trying to be inflammatory necessarily, but a Catholic drama was suddenly very controversial in a Protestant area. So the, the occult revival in theater, uh, what happened there that was really special was that they were really trying to put the spirituality back into theater, which had been sort of legally and socially removed for centuries at that point. Wow, that's mm. so cool. And, and mm. how did you come to become interested in this topic and, and to write your book? Because I, I'm assuming it must be a, a bit of a, of a niche within theater studies, within it the is. academia. Yeah. yeah, in fact, when I first started working on it, all, except for one teacher, almost all of my, my professors were like, what are you doing? This is, is this important? It seems really weird. And, and uh, <laughs> uh well, how it really happened is, is when I was studying for my PhD, I had this amazing, and I'd always been interested in the occult. Uh, I've, I've, I, I myself have practiced magic, uh, and, and I'm just generally I'm into uh, occult art, and, and, and uh, you know, I think I really got interested in it because I was raised in a fundamentalist Christian home, and, and people would come in and talk about the reality of the occult, and, and I, I, 
instead of driving me away from it, I got really interested in it. <laughs> in it. And, um, and, uh, and so by the time I got into theater, I had started watching and listening to everything I could that, that kind of, uh, had to do with that because I'd been told it was absolutely real, you know? And, um, and, uh, and I don't think real is the important question, uh, when it comes to it, but by the time I moved to, to Manhattan, I moved to Manhattan and then I started getting my PhD. I grew up in Houston, Texas, but I moved to Manhattan. I started working on my PhD after living there many years. And there was this, an amazing scholar who, uh, who you, you might be interested in his work named, uh, Daniel Gerald is his name. And he ended up being my mentor. I studied under him and, uh, he was the chair of my dissertation. And uh, he was one of the first scholars to start writing about the symbolists and, and writing about their connections to the occult and not in a pejorative way, but rather talking about it as an interesting uh, uh, social development. And when I was reading it because of the work I had done in the past out of my own interest, I realized that a lot of the language these people were using in their plays uh, and in their theories about theater were drawn from uh, esoteric theories, and and uh, I became interested in wondering. I wonder if occultists. I wonder if those symbolist artists were occultists, and I wonder if occultists in that time period were interested in symbolist art. And what I discovered when I was uh, studying, I discovered that uh, pretty much every symbolist artist uh, uh, working between the late nineteenth century and say nineteen twenty. Uh, was it at least uh, tangentially connected to an occult movement or organization, or they were quite devoted. Uh, and then what I also discovered, then I also discovered that almost every famous occultist from that time period, Rudolf Steiner, Aleister Crowley, uh, uh, Catherine Tingley, um, they had direct connections to the avant-garde theater of that time as well. And, uh, and that's really how that book came about because that, the book, I, what I did that was different is I wrote a book about occultists who tried to make theater for occult purposes. And, and, and that's how that came about. It's kind of a long path, but it got there. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, you know. that, that, that's super cool. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah. I, I've mentioned before uh, on the show, one of the things that kind of brought me to Gnosticism was, was the symbolist because mm -hmm. it displays yeah. my favorite art movement. So both, mm -hmm. both, uh, both the visual, but particularly the music, right? particularly Satie. So reading about Satie and finding out some of the, the connections mm -hmm. that he had and then finding out about this thing. And then it led me to, uh, you know, our branch of Gnosticism, which comes out of, uh, you know, the, the French, the French occult revival, uh, mm -hmm. for the most part, although it has some earlier roots as well, but one of the, yep. <laughs> one of the things, um, anyways, uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, if we love talking about the, the intersections between art, imagination, spirituality on the show. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, Jason. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I wanted to kind of jump in there because I, like, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of details about a lot of the figures in your book that, that I, I think we want to get into, but mm -hmm. because I don't want to, uh, I don't want us to end up having spent all our time just mm -hmm. on that or, or only on that, that level of mm -hmm. detail, um, I mm -hmm. want to kind of get, go up to like kind of a bird's eye view. This is more of a speculative question, mm -hmm. but, uh, like so, your your book is pretty localized in time and in a certain time. Yes, place, which I think yes. is is great. Yeah, there's a final chapter that kind of starts, but but that's like it's it's like more this relates to the present in this way. It's really yeah. about the occult revival. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So so this is to kind of take it take it out of that specific time and place, but to speculate is like, um, uh, uh, Jonathan's already mentioned. Like we've we've had previous shows. We want to do more shows on on specific artists who had esoteric history or uh, or mm -hmm. connections to their work we did a show on peladon but i think like yeah. i also want to just touch on on the the gnosis of art like the experience mm -hmm. of making art mm -hmm. uh and whether or not like or how that can be a gnostic experience the experience mm -hmm. of consuming art and how that can be a gnostic experience and mm -hmm. this is very very personal to me in the sense that um like i was raised uh lutheran um without mm -hmm. a strong level of theology or detail in that it was just kind of like more more almost united or uh as like general general christian i would say <laughs> yeah um, yeah and uh and it wasn't until i'd encountered gnosticism and descriptions of the experience of it and and its history and its cosmology that i'd found anything mm -hmm. that i found a spirituality that connected to what i feel like when mm -hmm. i'm 
and consume art. Yeah. Uh, so that so, so that's why it's a very personal connection to me. So I guess my question to you is is that uh, either theater specifically or art in general is mm -hmm. there uh, is that an avenue you find for a gnostic or mystical experience, whether or not like without getting too tied down by a definition of gnosticism or a definition mm -hmm. of gnosticism? I would say yes. Um, uh, for me, when I talk, when I think about gnosis, uh, well, you know, people will talk about knowledge, but for me, gnosis uh, relates to a knowledge that you are born with. Um, it relates to a knowledge that you don't really have to strive to have, but it relates to a knowledge that you have to experience. Um, so gnosis to me doesn't necessarily mean understanding so much it so much as it means uh experiencing experiencing the divine in a moment uh, mm. uh and uh for me performance theater uh either whether you're doing it uh, as the as the writer or if you're doing it as the uh, uh performer or you're doing it as an audience member there is uh, often, you, you don't get it all the time, but there's often this uh, really amazing moment where it feels like everyone in the room has lost an identity, has lost their identity, and they're all kind of one experiencing uh, some kind of a truth that's beyond even the performance itself, if that makes mm. sense. Yeah. And uh, I would say that's the same in uh, in ritual as well. Whatever your ritual is, like, you know, if you have a divine experience in a moment of uh, participating in performance in a church, in a Crowley and Gnostic mass, in a Wiccan ritual, um, there are these moments where you're kind of lifted out of your limited perception of self. Uh, and I do think that uh, performance and uh, participating in, being a part of that, uh, uh, can often be a catalyst to that sort of experience. Mm. And to, to, to even just speculate, uh, just an, an ounce further, and then we'll get back into the really interesting mm -hmm. meat there, is, mm -hmm. um, uh, is that also something that is possible w uh, between art and, art and audience, uh, even when the participants are not intentionally striving for that purpose? Yeah, yes. I think I think you'll often talk to people who, uh, you know, they'll go in to say, yeah, you know, they'll go in to see something and they'll think, I didn't think it was going to be that good, but then, oh my God, I was completely moved or I was, I, I you know, I, I was so, uh, I got lost in that particular performance. And, and I think that when people say that, there's an acknowledgement of uh, they got past their expectations, they got past uh, 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 sort of personal uh, demands and expectations on the moment, and they, and they were lifted somewhere else. And uh, so I think this is something uh, that can potentially happen in any art form. I mean, I can talk to you more about what I think is particularly special about theater and performed ritual and that sort of thing. But uh, uh, I think there is something about uh, experiencing uh, many different forms of art that can just lift us right out of, you know, for a moment you forget you're in a body. For a moment you are somewhere else and then you come back and those eternal moments, what, what uh, 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 another scholar named Marvin Carlson has said about theater, he's called it the eternal instant. You know, the, you know those eternal instants are why we look at art that's what oh, i believe you know so that is great that was it was kind of a leading yeah. question but you but that's a beautiful answer um yeah. the eternal the eternal moment did you say the eternal instant the eternal, the eternal instant. instant yeah um yeah well maybe my my last question this will kind of bring us back to to, to our points here where um is yeah i think like to hear why you think that theater maybe is particularly suited to that mm -hmm. um and then we can get get kind of into the details of the of the figures mm -hmm. in your book to me, what's amazing about uh, uh, theater um, as a performance form is it's a place where all the arts come together, really. They all come together. Uh, uh, painting comes together. Projection comes together. Live performance comes together. Uh, costume comes together. Writing comes together. You can put virtually anything. Theater is like kind of like an artistic soup bowl. You know, where where you can just like put 
everything in there and they all create this one so you you have the mini into the one right in theater mm -hmm. and um and it's required that's just just how uh the art works and um and i think because of that you have a really uh you have a really nice uh, example of a, of a mystical concept being played out. And I, and I don't think, for instance, it's a coincidence that uh, in ancient Greece, it was Dionysus who was associated with theater because theater is something where in order to perform it, you have to give up your identity, you know, mm -hmm. in order to, uh, in order to create it, you have to build this thing. It has to be built. And then at the end of the performance, it has to be dismembered. <laughs> and then it's rebuilt again, you know, and um, and uh, so for me, uh, the the connections between uh, the no, you know, the the experience of gnosis or the occult experience and and theater makes sense. And also, when you listen to uh, or if you read, uh, you know, I think about like you know, in something like the Secret Doctrine by Madame Blavatsky. Uh, Alephus Levy's writings, Aleister Crowley says it uh, over and over again in his writings. Um, Catherine Tingley, who most people haven't read, but I have a whole chapter about her in my book. Mm. Um, uh, they talk about uh, the idea that great theater artists, um, and it, it would relate to any other artist as well, but for them, it's very much about theater because they're very theater oriented, all those people were. Uh, they'll talk about, oh, Aeschylus, Shakespeare, Goethe, these different uh, writers, and they'll say they weren't just artists, they were seers. Mm -hmm. Rudolf Steiner said it as well. You know, he's like, the, whether they knew it or not, they're showing us a picture of a spiritual reality, you know? Mm. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, there is a whole, especially if we're going to go to fin de siècle, <laughs> there, 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 there is uh, just a huge body of literature, both in theater and outside of theater, in theater and in the occult, the realm of occult literature, that that really makes an argument that along the alongside the spiritual kind of pulses of humanity, there's a theater that's pulsing along with it, you know, mm. the whole time. And so that's just a really popular concept that that popped up in. Uh, during the occult revival, you know. Hmm. Extremely I love cool. it. Well, uh, maybe I'll come back to to the book. Uh, but before yeah. we kind of dive into <laughs> the uh, the movements and and some of the figures that you discuss in your book, in your critical opinion, was <laughs> any of the theatrical art any good? Because we've been exposed to lots of great occult work, but also lots of suck. Yes, and I agree with you. There is a lot of suck. And the truth is, <laughs> uh, the truth is, when you look at theater in general, there's a lot of suck. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I mean, it really is true, right? And, yeah. and, and you think back even to Aristotle's time, right? And he's talking about, you know, he's talking about three, four, five, six tragedians. And basically his argument is Euripides is a hack. Right. Like if you read Poetics, he's and Euripides is, is my favorite of the tragedians, which means that maybe I have poor taste. But uh, but his point is there are three people worth talking about at length. And that's Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides. And then there are these other people. Some of them did some pretty good stuff. But his whole point is the vast majority of the people writing and performing are just terrible. Like 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 that seems to be part of his argument is that most people just. Uh, uh, aren't creating good work. And the truth is, how much work is really high quality? So what happened during the occult ri of revival, I think, that was really interesting is you really had a period where uh, you had W.B. Yeats uh, writing some really amazing poetic drama. Um, you had all those amazing symbolist writers like... Uh, you know, you had Andreev in Russia. You had Maeterlinck, uh, uh, originally, originally from Belgium, but ultimately writing in France, just writing these amazing pieces. But there is a lot of dross in that in that time period as well. But I think that one of the things that happens in uh, occult art when we see it, and I think the same would have been true 
uh, back in the height of the occult revival is that um, there's a there's a lack of care for aesthetics. Like like <laughs> like during during the occult revivals, aesthetics were everything. I mean, it was like you look at you know, they had these beautiful gold objects. They had these, you know, they had Satie, these amazing composers coming in and creating these the, these works. And, and they were doing this. And um, when I look at, you know, for instance, in certain rituals I've participated in now, it's not really about aesthetics a lot of the time. A lot of the times it's about, uh, a lot of the times it's about, um, personal experience using whatever you have and not everyone there is some amazing uh, great performer or maybe it's more about the spiritual idea than it's about the aesthetic um, and when you get a really amazing work usually it's somebody who cares about the aesthetic as much as they care about the content so uh, mm -hmm. for instance I've seen many many different performances of uh, Crowley's Gnostic Mass many many different ones and uh, some are you know uh, you know they're just really you know, people doing their best but it's 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 about the experience and then some have been you know more ornate and and well rehearsed and you know and that sort of thing so I, and, and and i went to uh uh Dornock, switzerland and i saw all four of steiner's uh mystery plays performed there wow. uh back in 2000 and each of those plays is about six hours long in performance so <laughs> it's a it's a long process but i will say those plays were gorgeous they were mm. absolutely beautiful and and um uh my wife ran screaming uh from the space because it was just so long <laughs> you know but but uh but it was beautiful and she you know and then there you know so i think that um there was a, a demand there there was an understanding of the of the uh i think the spiritual power of uh or at least the otherwise inexplicable occult impact you know of mm. beautiful well crafted aesthetics um that uh some people some people take that seriously and um uh or have a capacity for that you know, and I think most people don't, you know, and so a lot of times when I see uh, different types of performance, I, I I don't tend to go in with uh, the same sort of critical eye that I'm going to go in with when I when I uh, like go to Broadway or something mm -hmm. there. The aesthetics better damn well be good because it's three hundred dollars a ticket. Right. <laughs> um, uh, but. I don't know if that answers your question, but but I think no, there's a lot. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank it's you. A, it's yeah. sort of that that mix of like because um, uh, I think especially with a lot of esoteric stuff, we have such it, we're so engaged with the subject yeah. that we forget we need to bring the audience on board with being as engaged. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. So and like, it also impacts the performer. I mean, mm -hmm. it very much impacts the performer. I mean. Uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna do some right that involves a something as simple as a cup and a wand and the touch the feel the weight the look of those objects impact even if you're alone in a room mm -hmm. the touch and the feel and the look of those objects they they impact you you know yeah so they're certainly going to impact anybody who's watching you exactly well, you know yeah so, so we, we've talked about theosophy before on the show, and we have actually have discussed it, its intersections uh, between theosophy and art, but mostly uh, painting and music. What mm -hmm. does it have to do with theater? Well, the uh, I often will will go to when you when you uh, when you look at a lot of the people uh, who talk about theosophy as performers. I mean, one of the people who's under who's kind of undercredited is Edward Charest. He's a he's a French uh, symbolist playwright, actually proto symbolist. He was even a little earlier, but he he was writing during that time period. Uh, he was a theosophist. And um, you read what uh, uh, Blavatsky has to say again in The Secret Doctrine um, and uh, and Kandinsky, you read what Kandinsky says to how, about color and things like that. Is there, 
Theosophy kind of provided a formula of artistic theurgy um, for uh, symbolist authors, but also for occultists who were trying to use art to invoke or to use art to otherwise unite with the divine in existence. Uh, and I do think that a lot of theosophy's uh, theories about artists as uh, magicians and particularly as theurgists uh, uh, impacted in, I mean, in a major way, it impacted the, uh, the symbolist movement. But I think also the, their theories remain influential, even though maybe they've been passed down through other artists more than through uh, theosophy itself. Um, I've, I've actually been very fortunate when I wrote my chapter on Tingley, Catherine Tingley in, in my book, uh, I developed a, a nice close working relationship with uh, the Theosophical Society in America. And they, they, they allow me to go there and, and stay on their property and, and, and go, go, you know, go through archives and, the uh, the amount of time I've spent there, spent there, I've you know it really is, uh, it really is a central concept. The idea that performance and theater and and really all art forms, um, uh, they can be uh, uh, they can be inspired by a connection with with the divine and and and, and a great deal of art from the theosophical uh, perspective is a, you know, a physical outgrowth and manifestation of that connection. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I find over the last uh, couple of years, really the last couple of decades, uh, Aleister Crowley, his, mm -hmm. his literary yeah. output has been mm -hmm. has been getting more acclaim, more yes. noticed. You know, yes. critics are, are looking mm -hmm. at it as, as important. Uh, you yes. know, uh, the, his poetry, you know, the, the White Stains mm -hmm. is now viewed as a very important early queer text, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. I, I understand that uh, uh, Crowley also uh, wrote plays uh, oh, yes. so with his with his you know new literary uh, uh, critical reevaluation. Can mm -hmm. you tell us uh, about his work as a director, a playwright, an actor, mm -hmm. his connections with theater? Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, sure. I mean, there's so much to say on on Crowley. He was definitely uh, uh, he was a man of the theater from from uh, from top to bottom. Uh, his most famous uh, directing job was definitely the Rites of Eleusis, which he performed in 1910 at Caxton Hall in England. Um, the Rites of Eleusis are a series of uh, rituals that uh, invoked different gods. And ultimately, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it, by the end, each god invoked was also dead by the end of that uh, rite because he was announcing the, uh, the new eon. He was announcing the new one, uh, new eon, which was going to move humanity away from the formula of the dying God as understood by uh, Fraser and uh, the Abrahamic uh, religion, uh, Christianity in particular. Um, but but even before that, all the dying God forms. But that was a very, very uh, notorious performance. And, and, and it was really that performance was a big part of uh, how he started to get his notorious reputation because a lot of journalists uh, not let's call them journalists but they were writing for the uh for the tabloids right uh a lot of people said things were going on in that performance which it's been pretty well documented were not actually going on um but he was he he also if you read magic and theory and practice he has uh, a whole chapter on what he calls dramatic ritual and um according to him uh, magic uh, the invocation, the art of invocation, there are three forms, and in his opinion, the dramatic form, which involves the taking on the theurgy again, uniting with the persona of a, of a deity and uh, performing its life story or performing some action as that deity. In his opinion, if you're a, if you're, if you're a performance-oriented artist, it, he thinks that's the best form of invocation that you could employ. Um, but so he he did the, he did the rites of Eleusis and and uh, he wrote many many plays. I'm actually putting together an anthology of his plays that I hope to publish. Um, and uh, I not long ago, I guess it was 2016, I republished 
uh, in PAJ, which is a performing a performance art journal. It's called PAJ, a Journal of Performance and Art. But I republished uh, one of his plays called The Savior, and um, and I published it with a little article about how I thought it related to World War One, which was raging at the time when he wrote it. But I would say he wrote. Um, I think he, he he wrote at least oh I'd say eighteen twenty plays, oh, wow. and and uh, some of them are good and some of them are not. Quite frankly, you know. But he's an amazing writer, and and the Savior I thought was a a, a great piece of uh, spiritual criticism, um, and uh, and he also was an impresario. Uh, he uh, after uh, after um, um, rights of Eleusis didn't go well for him. He put together a group of, uh, it was like a vaudeville, not a vaudeville show, but it was a traveling review with a bunch of women who played violin and danced, and he called it the Ragged Ragtime Girls, and they toured around Russia. And uh, when they were touring, that's when he wrote the Gnostic Mass. He was inspired by the uh, Russian Orthodox Mass, and he was inspired by that when he wrote the Gnostic Mass. Uh, but I would say that for him, uh, he says it very clearly, uh, ritual is a play, you know, and he, if you read his autobiography, he's constantly referring, referencing uh, Maeterlinck. Uh, he talks about, of course, you know, he had a big rivalry with Yeats, but he and Yeats were both symbolists as well, you know, and I often just kind of lump Crowley in as uh, another symbolist playwright. Uh and uh, for whom there was no distinction between spirituality and art. It wasn't there. Yeah. So, so you've mentioned the, uh, the uh, Crowley's Gnostic Mass uh, a, a few times, uh, the famous Gnostic Mass. Does theater have anything to do with his, with his Gnostic Mass? Theater? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I'd say yes, because uh, uh, if you read that piece, uh, if you read that piece, the, the level of stage directions in it, <laughs> Are only a playwright would write it like that, you know. If you if you look at you know if we look at like most uh, you know liturgical texts, um, they don't go too far into detail about everything everyone should be wearing or uh, how many times they should walk in this direction and what the floor should look like. We have to have black and white checkered floor, absolutely essential. Um, uh, discussions about uh, discussions about the disrobing of the priestess uh, behind the veil and whether or not she disrobes when it's opened again. Uh, the descriptions he's giving in there, they, they read more like a playwright than, than a magician, you know? Yeah. And I'm of the opinion that, uh, and he says it himself, I'm in the opinion that, that it's a play. You know, it's a symbolist play. Uh, but with But again, a symbolist play is also a ritual there's no there's not really much in the way of distinction between those this is amazing um like i said at the beginning it was kind of a leading question about mm -hmm. the whole uh like aesthetic experience as a mm -hmm. always a potential for gnosis or mm -hmm. or, or mysticism but um uh yeah it's uh it's just it's been it's been a real focus for me i did i did a talk uh so we do a conclave every year um mm -hmm. and then that is usually like kind of a conference and people have various presentations and and mm -hmm. my presentation was essentially around uh gnosticism and narrative theory and narrative uh ideas and and that in some respects rather than or alongside discussing a gnostic text from a historical or a um uh like a theological uh, um analysis that it's also like looking at these texts as literary texts and like yes uh, these folks as people who are engaged in a literary interaction with each other, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think is uh, kind of opens them up in interesting ways as well. You know. Yeah. No. Yeah. I th I think one of the uh, th one of the things I've really been getting into lately is uh, in the study, the, looking at the uh, scholarly study of magic, and I'm also an artist. I I I, I, I write plays. I perform. I I do film. Um, I'm a musician, you mm -hmm. know. So, so I'm an artist, and to me, there's not. A, I'm the same. I'm a symbolist. There's no distinction. Art is religion. It's all the same. <laughs> it's all the same thing to me. Yeah. But, but what I think is interesting is uh, 
the idea of the need to separate theater from religion or uh, from many scholars and also practitioner standpoints, the need to separate magic from religion, mm -hmm. um, that, that, that need to separate is in my opinion, uh, kind, often just kind of uncritically held onto by people, you know? You know, it's, like, you know. it's uh, the, uh, just a, like a, an idea that's striking me, like the, the, the do you know the podcast Schwepp, uh, the Secret History of Western Esotericism podcast? No, I haven't oh, heard it. I have well, to watch it. Listen. That's, yeah, that might be your, your new obsession because he goes through, he's okay. going through everything in a very like um, slow way. Uh, which is great. But anyway, he made a point, and I can't remember what period it is, but he was saying that there's there's a point around the beginning of like Christianity really becoming a forceful movement, mm -hmm. that the idea of truth became really important, that like that it wasn't just enough that like you, you believed what you believed, but you believed what you believed and it had to be true for everybody, if that yeah. makes sense. You had okay. to enforce that or expand that. Like, like that. universal truth. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I, I, I'm, to bring it back, is that I think there's a sense in, I think, in religion that uh, one religion or another must be true, and st art is often storytelling, therefore fiction, mm -hmm. therefore mm -hmm. false. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And so, oh yeah, oh, yeah. Let, let's keep those apart. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, and it's also a protection of what you're separating, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the thing is, is the separation of like, say magic and religion, that's pre-Christian. That goes back to the ancient Greeks that, you know, they yeah. they view religion as it came from Zoroaster, it came from Persia, um, not the same as our uh, official religions, you know, the mm -hmm. story of Medea is the story of a strange foreign witch, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, and then when we go into uh, and then we go into the late antiquity, post Julian uh, Christian era, uh, then it's oh yeah, theater. That's what they were the Romans were doing in the Colosseum. That's that's totally anti Christian. We have to separate that out, you mm -hmm. know. And mm -hmm. so there's a really interesting parallel between the sort of rejection of theater and the rejection of of magic in in society. It's really interesting. Oh, that's great. I uh, I think I heard Jonathan come back. And uh, Jonathan, I hope you can edit in some of what we just talked about. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm positive I can. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Or I'll just like, you know, uh, do a little edit and keep this conversation in right now. And let's just let okay. people look behind the curtain to use a very appropriate <laughs> metaphor. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll tie it back off with, with the uh, with Crowley's Gnostic Mass, which, is, which I've attended many times and definitely see it as, as a theatrical work. And that's also a magical ritual, which is, can be very powerful and transcendent. But if the if they don't if the if the actors the performers don't do it do it well, it's awful, right? Like I, I've yeah. sat oh, through yeah. it and I'm like I'm like this is like not even awful. It's silly. Like well, I, the, it's, the piece is, is is it's like designed to. I often say, I, I didn't make this up, but a wise person once said to me, theater is the art that wants to fail. You know? <laughs> you know? and, 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 and man, the Gnostic Mass is written with failure all over it. It's, it's like got so many requirements to it. And, and if you can't lose yourself in the moment of it, you're right. It's just a weird, awkward thing. <laughs> you know, but, 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 but when, and, when they pull it off it's like it's yeah. amazing and i and i've performed in it as well i've i've played the child role and i've also deaconed a few times in that so so i uh that's a that that's a piece that i i i thoroughly think is a wonderful uh wonderful piece and when you do it with a group of really great uh ritualists and you're all uh, on the same page and you're trying to transcend the difficulty because it's difficult you know the the kind of the complexity of the actions that are being asked of you and uh i think i think that you know it can be a really uh powerful piece and i've had a, a you know i i'm happy to say that i've had more good experiences with that one than i've had uh awkward ones so you mentioned the uh, eighteen hours worth of Steiner plays. Yes, <laughs> yes. that's amazing. Um, yeah, so yeah. you, you amazing. tell us uh, uh, about what Steiner and his followers uh, thought about live theater and what Steiner thought plays could do. Yeah, well, Steiner was uh, 
uh, he became controversial in the theosophical movement when he started. He started, he wrote his first two mystery dramas, uh, The Portal of Initiation and The Soul's Awakening. That's the name of those two. He wrote those uh, before World War I broke out. Um, and at that point, he was still a card-carrying member of the Theosophical Society. Um, and what he was really trying to do with that is he firmly believed that he, uh, and I believe he believed it. You know, I believe this is, I, I really have a lot of respect for Steiner, to be honest. He, he, he really lived and died by uh, what he was saying. And, and uh, but he, he believed that he could perceive spiritual realms. He perceived uh, these entities, Araman and Lucifer, and these uh, soul forces, and, and he perceived auras and a spiritual realm and an astral realm, and all these things were very complicated for him. Um, and uh, what he uh, was trying to do with the mystery dramas is he was trying to show to the best of his ability, an accurate representation of what he was perceiving, right? So he wrote uh, this story about a character named Johannes who's going through these different levels of, uh, of initiation. And in this case, initiation is not necessarily done through an order. It's an organic process that happens through uh, a self-taught uh, system, which that, that aligns with theosophy very well. Um, and uh, so what he really thought was by showing us uh, this picture that he saw, this story that he, he saw that, that it would awaken an organ, uh, like literally a physical organ within us that would enable us to begin to perceive the same realms that he was perceiving. So for him, he was trying to uh, uh, kind of jumpstart the capacity for clairvoyance within the audience member. Okay, extremely, extremely cool. And so when you yeah. saw the 18th, did it work? When you saw the 18 hours worth of plays? Well, I'll tell you what, if you sit through a play that's seven hours long, you will go into clairvoyant states, <laughs> no matter what. I mean, one of the most amazing, you know, one of the most amazing, it was sad, but the amazing thing I saw was there was this woman and we were all watching this play and I was the only person there who wasn't at you know, my German's really bad, you know, but, but I, I was there and there's this woman like three seats over from me and we'd been sitting there. This is like day two of like the marathon and she literally fell out of her chair, you know, shabunk. And then people were all around her and got her back up, you know, um, but the, but he demanded, uh, Steiner demands long dedicated concentration. So it becomes a, uh, beautiful meditational experience, you know, and I kind of think because I knew the plays, I'd studied them, but my German isn't as great as I would like. And so there was something actually kind of nice about that, you know, that half the time I didn't understand what they were saying, but I knew where we were in the story because I knew the plays, you know. Um, and, uh, but yeah, he demands a uh, he wants to meditate. He's speaking. He says in one of his writings, when you come into the Gertianum, I'm speaking from higher self to higher self. That's what I'm doing. So mm -hmm. it's not about the words, you know, even though he was very wordy, you know, but it was about something else, you know, and uh, he didn't expect uh, logical understanding. That's that's not really part of the experience. Uh, but uh, and, and the thing about those plays is they're in the Gertianum. And I don't know if you've ever seen images of the Gertianum. I have, but please describe it, yeah. Oh, I mean, it's a thousand seat theater and there are very few right angles anywhere. It's like, honestly, it's like Dr. Dr. Seuss carved a theater out of clay is what it feels <laughs> like when you go in there. And he has these one colored monochromatic stained glass windows just running the top and the bottom of this huge space when you go in and and the plays start in the morning and the sun is just shooting these beams of single colored light through the room it is just one of the most astounding spaces so we were talking about aesthetics steiner understood aesthetics you know and when you walk in there it's amazing you feel like you are in another universe the moment you walk in there and it was just so powerful 
you know. So, so we recently did, a, the, as Jason mentioned, or as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, an almost two-hour episode on, on Josephine Paladin, and we, you know uh, about his work, his uh, his curation of other people's work, but mostly uh, talking about his writing, uh, mm -hmm. the curation of of uh, visual art, and some of his connections mm -hmm. to composers. But the theater didn't come up. Did he also have connections to theater? Did he write plays? Or? He wrote plays. He wrote plays. If you go on archive.org. Uh, you can find plays. Uh, not very many of those that I found have been translated from French to English, but they they are there. I, I in fact, right before this <laughs> podcast, I, I wanted to make sure I wasn't remembering wrong, and and I went there and I was like, no, there it is. They have a three act uh, Paladin play right there. He also wrote novels. I went to Paris once and I bought an old paperback copy of one of his. Uh, one of his novels. Uh, I also happen to have written an article about Paladon's uh, Rosencross mm -hmm. Salon. Uh, it was at, uh, it was, I guess it was in 2016, they had uh, an exhibition of uh, the Rosencross Paladon uh, art. Uh, and, and that was at, uh, at the Guggenheim in New York. And uh, PAJ, writing for PAJ, I went there and I, and I, and I looked at a lot of the work a lot of the work there and a lot of the paintings and I wrote an article uh, about that with some illustrations. And so even beyond, you know, traditional performance, he would have these salons where, you know, there would be art around the room and then they'd play some sati music and then they'd perform some short scenes and they would, uh, they would have these really fascinating, and I think this was all done at a chapel in Notre Dame, um, but they, it, it was, uh, it was a very serious artistic endeavor, and yeah, performance was definitely part of Paladon's, uh, you know, vocabulary. Hmm. So, probably the most widespread, uh, popular, well-known, seeing a, a, a huge wave and resurgence among the youth is, uh, when it comes to esoteric movements, would be Wicca or witchcraft. Mm -hmm. what, what does Wicca have to do with an obscure <laughs> Rosicrucian the, uh, yeah. theater troupe? Well, you know, I primarily because I wrote that I wrote that uh, chapter in my in my book because I was surprised to discover that nobody had ever talked about uh, a Alex Matthews who who had that uh, that group and uh, and nobody had really talked about that Gardner had been a part of that uh, organization. So there was a guy named Alex Matthews who had a Rosicrucian theater uh, in southern England. And um, near Christchurch, which is which is near where uh, Gardner was doing uh, his stuff ultimately. So before Gardner went on his own, he was doing these plays. He was part of this theater group, uh, and um, it seems like you know he came back from the islands where he'd lived years as a plantation. He he had Gardner. I'm talking. He is Gardner at this point who I'm talking about. And when he came back to America, he was looking for interesting people to hang out with. You know how esoteric people are. They're always looking for their group of people to hang out with. And and uh, he went and he did uh, several plays and I found evidence that he was in a play. It was listed in a, in a paper uh, in this Rosicrucian theater that doesn't exist anymore. And, uh, and I, you know that really is the connection right there is is he was participated in that and then he went on and he uh wrote witchcraft today and uh but again he was also connected with crowley he was uh i've also been to the warburg institute and and i saw uh you know a couple of letters that he wrote to crowley uh, uh he was he was i think approaching a seventh degree level in the uh ordo templi orientis um but bottom line is, when you read Witchcraft Today, he, he's talking about ritual as drama as well, you know. And, of course, with Wicca, uh, drama is much more intimate. It's not, uh, it's not something you necessarily have to make a big show out of, right? You're not necessarily trying to make a, a, a big theatery uh, piece, although that happens as well. You know, like here in Ohio, uh, we have the Starwood Festival that pops up and there's a lot of uh, Wiccan performance that uh, uh, appears in there. But I think this idea of a sacred theater, a sacred ritual drama 
is central to Wicca, you know? And so I think the reason that's important is he's interested in theater. He's interested in, in Crowley because, you know, and no small part of that is the ritual of it. I mean, you don't, you don't have to know much about Wicca to know that Gardner loved his theatrics, you know? (laughs) <laughs> and and he loved his his props and he loved his uh he he liked to go out and do the circle you know and and uh so uh the primarily i looked at that rosicrucian thing as an interesting it's an interesting thing that gardner did before he went out and found his own path you know i kind of feel like gardner started uh he made a choice you know because many people talk about is is magic public or is it private you know many people talk about that and and i think for gardner it became semi-private you know it's not something you do in front of a bunch of people and honestly crowley went the same way because after he did the rites of eleusis and he got dragged through the mud so much he decided he even says in magic and theory theory and practice it's a play but you should probably do it for people who are already initiated (laughs) interesting yeah Yeah. interesting So by the 1940s, really by World War One, but by the 1940s, definitely, you know, this first generation of, of the occult revival, they're, they're, they're mostly all gone. They're mostly dead. Um, mm-hmm. When they when, when they died out, when they were gone, did occult the, uh, theater also die out? I don't think occult theater died because a St- Steiner was part of that, and that continues, right? Um, uh, if we're going to take Wicca and view that as a cult theater, that you know, that continues. If you're going to view Crowley, that continues because the uh, the uh, the rites of Eleusis and, and the Gnostic Mass are, are, are performed continually to this day. Um, so I wouldn't say that they died. I think maybe another way to view it is, uh, view it is were there any innovations after that? <laughs> were there any innovations after that? You know, and mm-hmm. I, I think there were, you know, and, and, but what I think is interesting is some of those innovations entered the realm of, uh, radical, uh, uh, you know, like radical professional theater, you know? So one of the interesting things that some people don't know is the famous, uh, uh, British director, Peter Brook who worked with the Royal Shakespeare Company. Before he got out of college, he produced Dr. Faustus. This would have been in the you know early 40s. And he actually brought in Crowley to give him notes on how to do the invocation scene. <laughs> how to do the invocation scene. And apparently a very old and extra crazy Crowley was in the auditorium <laughs> screaming, you've got to use real blood. <laughs> it can't be fake. <laughs> You know, he was he was in there saying that's one of my favorite story <laughs> favorite stories about Crowley. You know, and Peter Brook uh, was influenced by uh, a uh, uh, theater theorist, one of the most influential theater theorists, named Antonin Artaud, a French theorist who started in the 1920s working with lots of people. He was very immersed in the occult revival. He died in the 1950s, but he developed a theory of theater called uh, uh, the theater of cruelty, which remains very influential to this day. Um, Theater of cruelty, the idea is that theater is not supposed to entertain, it's supposed to confront the audience with uh, their abyss and it's supposed to purge them of things. And by the way, this is, really what Aristotle says about tragedy when he's talking about catharsis, you know, mm-hmm. the idea that you purge these negative emotions out of yourself by confronting these horrible stories, you know. And um, so, you know, Arto wrote some great essays. One of them is called The Alchemical Theater. It's about purifying the self through through theater. And, uh, and then in the late 60s, so we had these groups like The Living Theater, who came out and they started, uh, you know, taking their clothes off and pulling people on the stage and talking about your chakras and all that kind of stuff. But they were what professional theater, mm-hmm. and and but they were doing an occult thing, you know, and and a gnostic thing, you know. They were trying to anyway, and and they they really impacted a lot of the direction of uh, performance as it went. And and so for me, as as time goes on and as 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 the as performance goes on, um, I think it's hard to uh, I, I I think we've we've come past a realm where uh, the occult theater meant oh what occult organization are you part of, 
you know, and yeah. we co- come into a place where people, uh, the idea of micro spiritualities, people are feel very free to make their own idiosyncratic performance. And, and, and I think when you look at it that way, there's probably a lot of really good occult theater out there that's hiding as just theater, you know? Mm. Um, and, and, uh, and I know there are a lot of people on the esoteric side who, who you know, who are longing to uh, uh, raise their aesthetic values as well and, and work in mm. things. But but I also just tend to think that theater people, there are a lot of theater people like myself who are just into these things, you know, and, you know, there's really a lot of uh, a lot of my own work as an artist uh, connects to that in some way, even if I'm directing Dr. Faustus, or if I'm directing The Tempest by Shakespeare, I, mm-hmm. I did a version of The Tempest about two, three years ago at my university, and we pulled in all this imagery from John D. Uh, and Enochian magic into that, and and it was powerful. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting to do that. So I, I think, uh, again, this idea of separating the two things organically, I just don't think it's a clean separation. It's like separating spaghetti from pasta sauce it doesn't really work very well it uh it's kind of what you talked about um regarding how theater is like uh everything in one you know it's like a very much that idea of the solve et coagula like bringing it all together absolutely absolutely and uh yeah like i'm even just thinking about something like uh, sleep no more you know Mm -hmm. uh as a as a theatrical experience that's in i I think it's still well who knows if it's still going in new york i haven't checked with Mm -hmm. covid and everything but yeah i don't know but um, yeah, yeah uh, or or Mackers with the uh, with the three witches. Um, uh huh. Oh yeah. Considering, oh. considering my group here, I'm superstitious enough to not say the name. Yeah, you I'm know, it's only supposed to be that. dangerous in a theater. I just try to stay out of that habit entirely. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm actually reverse religious about that. Whenever oh, I do okay. a show, before anyone comes in, I, I walk in the space and I say Macbeth 13 times before I start <laughs> rehearsing. I do that at the beginning. And any time I haven't done that, something just horrible has happened in my show. So. <laughs> That's amazing. <Yeah. laughs> uh, just one other quick thing I wanted to jump in on was that you mentioned um, uh, that even Aristotle talked about the, the process of like, tragedy helping like remove things from the audience yeah the, cathar- the catharsis. catharsis catharsis yeah, yeah. but it, it's like it's very much like um you know uh good art can often be in a way an exorcism yeah. yes and in fact mm-hmm. Arto describes it as such so ah. the guy i was talking about Arto. Arto says theater is not an entertainment it is an exorcism Mm. You know, so he flat out comes out and says that I, I, after the show, if you want, I'll, f- I'll find the place where he says that and send it to you. But that is that, would be great. that is a central idea for Arto is that you've got these negative and, and Arto had a lot of things he was dealing with. And for him, theater helped him that mm-hmm. way. But uh, yeah, the idea of theater is an exorcism. And I think the living theater uh, took that up as well and mm-hmm. said that. But yeah, that's a recurring idea. Hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just riffing now. It's it's yeah. Oh, it's such no, a fun yeah. Subject. yeah, no, yeah. exactly. Well, we should start to wrap up or wrap up. Did you have any other uh, riffs or questions, uh, Jason? Anything else popping into your mind? You know, I think uh, in a way you answered it already because I was starting to ask about like uh, what are what are people making now? Like, what are some artists that are making stuff now, or at least in the more modern or contemporary sense? And I think you've already kind of gone there. Um, um, is there, unless there's anything you'd like to specifically? Well, call out. I, th- I think one thing that's really fascinating to me in the age of COVID, as well, is mm. the the amount of uh, uh, huge amount of stuff as far as the occult is concerned that's happening, like online. You know, when I'm looking at, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I think everyone know anyone who's into the occult knows TikTok, right? Mm-hmm. Like you go to TikTok and like there are people doing these little mini rituals in there and. Um, mm. And I think that uh, somehow there's a, there's a little bit of a, and it's not that anybody's doing anything particularly famous, but I think down the road, somebody's going to do something really interesting on the occult line and they're going to do it. They're going to do it online mm. is, is how it's going to happen because man, TikTok has exploded with that. And, and I just love the, uh, the kind of art for art's sake or playing for playing's sake that that's happening uh, uh, on all these different online formats. Um, so I think more than theater, 
if you're looking for kind of the occult performance experience, uh, it's really alive online right now. Mm -hmm. You know, that's great. Very cool. Well, I've been flashing up the address uh, where people can get the book. I'll also put it in the show notes. But everybody go out and buy a copy of the Theater of the Occult Revival. Uh, for my plugs, violentmeditation.substack.com. Uh, uh, I work part-time as a meditation coach with secular mindfulness. So for more experience and to meet with my students and my friends and to have a regular meditation time, I do free guided uh, meditation that's good for both beginners and experience and it's a mix of guided and silence uh, every morning not every morning, every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Montreal time is Eastern Standard Time. Uh, Jason, your plug is sagetheater.com Exactly so, yeah. <laughs> Hey, you can also go to jasonmemel.com Exactly um, yeah, Dr. Lincoln, thanks so much. It's been truly amazing having you. I say this to all the guests. You know, the other guests are going to watch the show and say, he said the same thing to me, but I mean it. Uh, but I especially <laughs> mean it speaking to you because this is a, you know, a, a topic that, that's really near and dear to us. And, and actually, just about everybody else who works on the podcast has some sort of theater uh, professional background as well. So, <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, thanks again. And uh, bye, everybody. All right. Thank you so much. Bye.